Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> First, permit me to thank you for a very generous introduction. And permit me also to thank the ANSA Foundation for allowing me to be present here in Accra, Ghana on this 28th day of the month of August, the year 2015. It is a great privilege for me to be present in this land. This is indeed a great land. It is the home of two of Africa's greatest sons, James Emin Kwejiragri, Agri of Africa, and the Sanjay for Dr. Kwame Lukuruma. is married here in Ghana. Mm. And if there were any doubts at all, this is a confirmation of my Pan-Africanist credential. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I've been asked to talk about the continent of Africa. And many of you will be aware that there has been no shortage of people who have spoken about Africa. But the issue of governance in Africa is an evergreen subject. And I hold the view that there is no better place to talk about governance in Africa than Accra, Ghana. <laughs> many of you who are present here were not born when Ghana attained her political independence. But there are few who are present here on the sixth day of March, the year 1957. It was a great day. And those who are familiar with history will remember the memorable speech of the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nukuruma. He was as enthusiastic as he was eloquent when he said, it has ended, Ghana will be free forever. Mm -hmm. And on that day, Ghana, then known as Gold Coast, changed her name. Because in the nature of things, when you acquire a new character, you must change your name so that the old things are consigned to the Museum of History alongside the Spinning Wheel. And Kwame did, and Ghana did. And after Ghana attained her independence on that sixth day of March 1957, Accra became the political mecca of Africa. Every African leader was incomplete until they came to Ghana. If it was not Dauda Kairabe Jawara of Gambia, here. It was Ahmed Seko Ture of Guinea. If it was not Seko Ture of Guinea, it was Modibo Keita of Mali. If it was not Keita, it was Mokta or the Dao of Mauritania. And if it was not any one of them, Saka Stevens of Sierra Leone was here, as indeed was Felix Ufe Wanyi of Cote d'Ivoire. And it was not restricted to West Africa. From East Africa, our own Jomo Kenyatta, Ethiopia's Hei Silas, Tanzania's Walimu Julius Tambarage Nyerere, and Uganda's Apollo Milton Obote, they were here because this was the place where the anointing had to be received. <laughs> came here, and from the Central Africa, he was not the only one. Kenneth David Kaunda of Zambia was here, as indeed was Ngwazi Dr. Hastings Kamuzubanda of Malawi. Even those who are not close to independence,
Americans from Mozambique, Eduardo Mondlane was here, as indeed Samora Moises Masha. In Angola, Agostino Neto was here, as Holden Roberto was here, as Jonas Maimhero Savimbi was also here. Those who knew that they would not attain independence in the near future, Sam Muyoma came from Namibia, as indeed did Andy Bahama and Toibuya too. Nelson Mandela was here. This was the home of freedom. And Kwame Nkrumah said that the decolonization project would be incomplete if indeed the other African leaders were not free. He started with enthusiasm. And he indeed joined me with Hayes Silasi and Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, who are the few Africans of the day who took the view that Africa could only realize our potential if Africa was united. Writing, therefore, as early as 1965, he was able to identify in his famous book, Neocolonialism, the Last Stage of Imperialism, that if Africa was not united, the neocolonial project would be alive and well, and all the gains that had been achieved would be lost. But earlier than that, the Osage for assembled 32 African leaders in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And if you read his speech on that day, on the 24th day of March 1963, the sense of urgency he appealed to the leaders present at that forum. He cajoled them, unite now. Let us not live here without one Africa, where there is no restriction of borders, where there are no visas, where we have one currency. Let us not live here without one army. Let us not live here without our unity. But they listen to him now. What we ended up with, was a diluted version of what the Osage for wanted in the name of the Organization of African Unity, which for a long time was only famous as an annual jamboree of dictators and everywhere. <laughs> but several years down the line, on the ninth day of July, in the year 2000 in Johannesburg, South Africa, those who did not believe that the Osage for was right then took the view that we had to be the African Union, and indeed, the man who was born ahead of his time and had the foresight of a Jewish prophet had been proved right. But Africa is a strange continent. Africa is a strange continent with individuals who claim to be leaders, but in truth they are misleaders. Africa is a strange continent, a continent that does not recognize that which is valuable. Africa is a strange continent. Ghana is like other African countries. Ghana is a strange country. As indeed Nigeria is a strange country. No sooner had we attained our political independence than the neo-colonial project started to rise ugly head. The Osage for was removed from power, and it was not only him. Sylvanus Olympia in Togo was removed from power, as indeed Nambi Azikiwe and Abubakar Sata, Fawabadewa, were removed from power, as indeed was Patrice Emery Lumumba. And indeed, coup d'etats became so frequent that Afro pessimists said that coup d'etats were as frequent as breakfast in Africa. But even breakfast was not that frequent. <laughs> the problem of Africa had acquired a monstrous character, and Africans were squandering the opportunity. Some Afro pessimists and indeed Afro optimists said, and I agree with them, that it was better while we waited. Because when we got it, we have squandered our past and I am in the process of sacrificing our future. And that is why, on this day, when you have given me the opportunity to talk about governance, I am happy to be present here with you. 
because it gives me an opportunity to ask certain uncomfortable questions which Africa and Africans must answer and pose at once. I remember so very vividly that when we attained independence, one of the things that we said we must do is to exercise the ghost of colonialism, to demonstrate that we have become of age, to demonstrate that we could do our things. And we started in all sectors of the economy talking about Africanization. We were clear in our minds that we were not children of a lesser God. So we started with our agriculture. And we said that Africa must feed herself. That Africa must not import food from Europe and America. That here in West Africa, when you produce cocoa, you must not export raw cocoa, you must add value. That you lovers of jollof rice must consume jollof rice that is produced here in Ghana. So we went into agriculture. We devoted a good percentage of our gross domestic product into agriculture. But as I speak to you now, African agriculture is in a sorry state. Mm. Ali Mazuru is right. Africa produces what it does not consume and consumes what it does not produce. <laughs> and if it was not agriculture, we went into the transportation industry. Every African country had an airline. In East Africa, we had East African Airways. Nigeria had their Nigerian Airways. Ghana had their own. Malawi had their own. Zambia had their own. As I speak to you today, they have all been consigned into the Museum of History. <laughs> Even our own Kenyan Airways is about to collapse. It's in a state of animated suspension. <laughs> we lost it out. We said we wanted our railways. And we threw out our colonizers. Today our railway lines have died. The little bits of them that remain and we are trying to rehabilitate are incapable of rehabilitation. We lost our railway. We brought in our post office and we said we want to deliver our mail, not the royal mail. And we created them today. None of us is comfortable with our own post offices. We rely on FedEx and DHL and UPS. We have lost faith in our things. We, as Africans, must ask the critical question. We introduce our currencies. You, the Ghanaians, have your city. The Kenyans, we have our shilling. The Angolans have their Kwanzaa. Malawi and Zambia have their Kwacha. The South African, they are running. But today, we are running away from our currencies. We are dollarizing our economies and putting things on the basis of the dollar. And our central banks are engaged in voodoo economics. <laughs> we have seen that by periodically injecting dollars in the market without the support of goods and services, mm. that the economy will grow. That is voodoo economics. <laughs> Given the opportunity 
to govern ourselves, we have demonstrated that we are incapable. And we who have been given the opportunity to create systems that can run our countries, we have the pension of bastardizing and making the absurd normal. That is the African tragedy. Africa will only liberate herself when her young men and women and her old men and women are capable of asking critical questions. Today, many African leaders are famous for the wrong things. Many African leaders, without being diplomatic about it, are thieves. Many African systems are simply regime, the government of the least qualified. Many African countries are kleptocracies. The government where thieves have come together and have conspired to do only one thing, to rob their countries dry. Yes, sir. The leaders of Africa are guilty, and I want to submit to you that the leaders of Africa are guilty. We, the population, are also in equal guilt. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and of our country. Because whenever we are given an opportunity to engage in elections, we elect individuals on the basis of their ethnic extraction mm. and on the basis of the, the depth of their pockets. The question is, should we even be allowed to vote? This is an uncomfortable question, but it's a question that we must now ask. Yes, sir. Many African countries are engaged in something that we call democracy. But what is democracy when democracy is franchised in Paris in the same way that French fries are franchised to us? What is democracy when the kind of democracy we are talking about is democracy that is franchised in Washington, D.C.? Many African countries do what is in the best interest of their former colonizing powers. If you are colonized by the Portuguese, you look to Lisbon. If you are colonized by the Spaniards, you look to Madrid. If you are colonized by the Belgians, you look to Brussels. If you are colonized by the English, you look to London and the Johnny come lately of the Anglophone world, the United States of America. Indeed, the tragedy of Africa is that we have allowed ourselves to be abused. We are the only continent in the world that commentators refer to in terms that have failed and refused to embrace. That there is an Africa called the Francophone. And when you go to those countries, it's actually the minority who speak French. <laughs> that there is an Africa which is called Anglophone. And when you go to those countries, it's the minority who speak English. That there is an Africa that is called the Lusophone. And when you go to those countries, it's the minority who speak Portuguese. The tragedy of Africa today is that Africans actually marvel. Those who are colonized by the British actually are proud that they are better than the Portuguese because Portugal is a backward European nation. And those who are colonized by the French are equally proud. We of the Negroid race are saying that our slave masters are better than the other slave masters. It is a tragedy of gigantic proportion. And it is because we who are present here across Africa, whether one is talking about Johannesburg, South Africa, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, or Tunis in Tunisia, or Dhaka in Senegal, or Freetown in Sierra Leone, or indeed any other African capital, we have failed to seize the opportunity. And because we have failed to seize the opportunity, our young men and women are drowning on a daily basis mm. in the Mediterranean Sea, where they are running away from our countries to go to Europe and asking the erstwhile colonizers, enslavers, colonizers, we are tired. We want to come back to the flesh pots of Egypt. The tragedy of Africa is a tragedy that will be told for a long time, and it's a tragedy that we must do something about. Today, we who are present here must ask difficult questions. We must ask ourselves, why is it 
And if you look at our government formation, we have things that look like organized power. Every African country has a president whose photo must, as a mandatory requirement, appear on the walls of shops. Mm. And if they don't, you are punished for it. All of us have presidents who you must address as your excellency. And if you don't, you'll be punished for it. We have parliaments compete with individuals that we call MPs. And we elect regularly on a daily basis. And they must be addressed as they insist they must be honorable. <laughs> we have judiciary. We have their judges trained and they insist that they must be addressed as my Lord. And we address them, yet corruption is alive and well. Yet injustice is alive and well. Yet the rule of law is conspicuous by its absence. What is the problem of Africa that we are formed without substance? You and me know that in agriculture that we have talked about, we cannot feed ourselves. <coughs> in the health sector, we cannot treat our people. I've said it before and I say it now. Many of our countries have been generating graduates from their medical schools. We have our hospitals populated by doctors. If you ask the president of any African country when they have a call that they should attend the public hospital in their own country, they refuse. They will tell you, I'm not suicidal. I must go to Europe and America. What has happened to us? We have education systems in which we have no faith. We call them free education. But it's only the very daring that allow their children to attend such schools. <laughs> All members of our political class will ensure that their children are studying in the United States or in Europe. They have no faith in the education system. We are attracted to things that are not made in Africa. If it is in the arts, our young men and women are attracted to Hollywood. Is the Hollywood actor that we love, Tom Cruise, <laughs> Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt. The Nigerians only mention Jackie Apia and Nadia Buhari and John Dumelo when they are forced to do so. <laughs> it is not Bollywood that we love, it's Hollywood that we love, it's Hollywood that we love, not Nollywood. Not bongo wood, <laughs> not river wood. Our scientists are only happy if they are recognized by the Nobel Foundation. Africa has no faith in herself. When you love them, which football team they love, they'll tell you every name of every, every English player alive. And what they did, and what they eat, and what they like, and what they don't like. It was always a battle of the mind, and those who have lost that battle in the mind will, will fail 10 out of 10 times. And I want to submit to you that indeed that is the tragedy of Africa. But Chinua Achebe was right. <coughs> the tragedy of Africa is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. The men and women that we entrust with leadership are men and women who are ill-suited for leadership. It is a tragedy that is periodically visited upon us. I've said it before, that how can Africa periodically and repeatedly allow hyenas to take care of goats? It is the nature of hyenas to consume goats. And when our leaders do that, we are surprised. I want to submit to you that we have been too nice to each other for too long. And the time has come that we Africans must call things by their proper name. Yes. It is only when we do so that Africa will begin to recognize and to realize that we are moving in the wrong direction. Yes. We will not address our economies if we don't trade in Africa. African trade is not more than 40%. 
There is shortage of maize in Zimbabwe as I speak, but there is surplus of maize in Uganda as I speak. Ugandans are importing milk from Switzerland, and yet there is excess milk in Kenya and in Uganda. In this very hotel, last evening, <laughs> I told a friend of mine at the reception, when you look very keenly, the time zones of New York are indicated. The time zones of Sydney, Australia are indicated. The time zones of Dubai is indicated. The time zone of Johannesburg is indicated. I would have thought that they indicated the time zones of Nairobi, Kenya, of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and of that high in Senegal, but no, our default natural inclination is to the colonizers. <laughs> Even in matters of time, we still look to them. The neo-colonial project is alive and well. The neo-colonial project is being fed by our docility and our ignorance. The neo-colonial project is becoming a monster that is going to consume us, you know. Africa has suffered. Not so long ago, from a historical standpoint, Africans were taken out of this continent. Over half the population of Africa was taken out of this continent. You only have to go to the point of no return in Dakar, Senegal, to appreciate man's inhumanity to man. Africans who are taken to Europe and America to fuel the engine of the emerging agrarian industry in Europe and America. Africa lost it then. When slavery had lost its luster, another project was hatched. European sat in Berlin in 1884, and they parceled out Africa as fears of influence. The Germans were there on that day. They took their Tanganyika, they took their Namibia, they took their Togo. The British were there on that day. They took their Nigeria, they took their Ghana, they took their Sierra Leone. Even the Americans who were there earlier, they brought their former slaves to Liberia, they were there. The Spaniards who were there, they took their Equatorial Guinea and they took their Saharawi, they were there. The Belgians who were there, they took their Congo and they took their Rwanda Uruni, they were there. The Italians who were there, they tried to take Ethiopia, they did not succeed, but they took their Somalia, they took their Libya, they were there. And that project ended up in colonization, and the conflicts that we have there can be traced to that past. But once again, it was the Osagia for Kwame Nkrumah, speaking in Cairo in 1964, who said, let us not disturb the boundaries that we have, because when we begin to do so, tell me, which country will not be at war with which country? And we accepted those boundaries and we are with them. But the point I'm trying to make is that we were colonized. Then we started recognizing that we had to free ourselves. And I can hear the voice of black men throughout the world saying that we must free ourselves. I can hear the voice of Marcus Garvey of Jamaica. I can hear the voice of W.E.B. Du Bois in the United States of America saying we must be free. I can hear those voices being joined by the voices of Kwame Nkrumah, of Kamarake Nyerere, and of Gamal Abdel Nasser. And I can see us gaining our freedom. And I can see us holding the promise that we shall govern ourselves well. And I can hear Kwame Nkuruma say, let us not look east nor west, let us look forward. And I can hear Nkuruma with Josip Gross Tito of Yugoslavia and Jawarna 
Al Nair will be in the aside that we are not looking neither east nor west. We are going to form our own body, the non aligned movement. We will be non aligned and positively neutral. I can hear them so very loudly. But the question is when they rise up today, Kwame Nukuruma, when he rises up, Ahmed Seko Ture, when he rises up, Kambaraki Nyerere, when he rises up, Ahmed Ben Bella, when he rises up, Patrice Semiri Lumumba, when he rises up, Ahmed Fahijo, when he rises up, Mandela, when he rises up, what would be Doom so, doom so. <laughs> doom so, doom so in the 21st century when in 1950s Kwame Nkrumah had said we must build the Akoso Moda. When in 1960 Gamal Abdel Nasser had said we must build the Aswan Haida. When in 1960, Patrice Emery Lumumba had said we must build the Inga Dam. When in 1960s, Haile Selassie had said we must build the Give Dam in the 21st century, do so, do so. <laughs> and it's not only in Ghana. In Gambia, they may call it by another name, but it's do so. <laughs> in Kenya, they may call it by another name, but it's do so, do so. In Tanzania, they may call it Ngao or Umeme, but it's do so, do so. This do so <laughs> Destroyed 
the Congolese territory like a colossus. He thought it was God's gift to Zion. But when he died, he did not even have a piece of earth to be buried in. His model remains lie in Morocco. It is a lesson to African people. And we thought that, multi, that the military would solve our problems, and we know Africans are good at dancing at every opportunity. <laughs> when we were expelling the first generation leaders, we danced. When the military came in, we danced. When they went out, we danced. When the guerrilla leaders came in, we danced. When they went out, we danced. When we elect our leaders, we danced. When they mess up, we danced. <laughs> we were not dancing. <laughs> <laughs> we have done for too long. We must now think. The great René Descartes was right. Cogito ego sum. I think so I am. Africans must now begin thinking because going forward, it is our ability to think that will ensure that we are creative and innovative. You know, if you allow me a little latitude about it, I know I inability to think. Not so long ago, the President of the United States of America, Barack Obama, visited Kenya. There was a lockdown in Nairobi. You had a similar lockdown in Accra when he visited for eight hours. <laughs> Americans came to shock and owe us, and they shocked us and they owed us. A few days later, I was traveling to my rural home, and I sat at the airport, and next to me were three professionals, one an architect, one a lawyer, one an expert in pension, and they were marveling about the American president's car, the beast. <laughs> and I said to myself, in a world where other civilizations are thinking about nanotechnology, we are marveling about a car. <laughs> we are marveling about a car. We are marveling about a car. It is a statement of our mental underdevelopment. Mm. And that mental underdevelopment is alive and well in the men and women that we have entrusted to lead us. And we must change it if Africa is to realize our potential. Mm. The time has come that we must also ask ourselves whether the thing we call democracy, as franchised to us from Washington, Paris, Lisbon, is the kind of democracy that we need. I have no doubt that there are things that are of universal application. The American Declaration of Independence captured the spirit of what I believe is universal. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are born equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All human beings have that urge to be happy. But in Africa, Happiness is just but an occasional episode in a drama of pain. <laughs> and the reason why it is such an episode is misgovernment. We must ask ourselves whether we should not go back to the past and ask ourselves what were the positive attributes of our traditional leadership methods. Every civilization is doing that. The Chinese have done that and they have something to show for it. The Japanese have done that and they have something to show for it. South Korea has done that and they have something to show for it. Even the Arabs in Dubai, which has now become our commercial mecca, has done that and we go there periodically, we of the middle class, to marvel at their skyscrapers and to marvel as to how they have subdued the earth. What must we do? We must interrogate them. We must ask ourselves why it is that when I fly from Nairobi, Kenya, I am confronted with all manner of currencies which are not worth the paper they are printed on. That I come from the Kenyan shilling, flying for a few minutes, I meet the Rwandese franc and the Burundian franc, 
and immediately I cross the border, I leave the Congolese franc, and I leave the CFA franc, which is fed on a currency that is long dead, the French franc, and I come here, I leave the city, I go to Nigeria, I leave the Naira, and in the United States you fly for six hours, no border posts, no visas, no yellow fevers, and you only have one currency, the dollar. These are painful questions, but we must ask them, because it is only when we ask them that we will be able to answer in the right way. Africa must ask difficult questions. There are those who say that those who ask these questions are armchair theorists. But the last time I checked, the entire race for changing humanity is a relay race. There are those who must theorize from the armchair. There are those who must verbalize and rhetoricize from the pulpit. And there are those who must seize the spirit and begin the movement. And there are those who must implement is a relay race. Those who plant the seed must allow others to water the seed. And those who water the seed must allow those who will prune it. And those who will enjoy the shade are different. But the other thing that bedevils Africa is the thing called corruption. <laughs> Writing in the year 2012, the editor of the New African says in the editorial, how I wish that one day Africans would be able to say, like it is said of death in the Bible, corruption, where is thy sting? Where is thy sting, corruption? Because in those days, we will have eliminated corruption. Today, in Africa, we hung the gold thieves and they left the big thieves in the public office. <laughs> that is the African problem. We call them by different names. Economic crime, they are thieves. <laughs> That's all space space. We vilify little thieves in our villages and defy the big thieves. Even in places of worship, when a thief enters the church, even the pastor poses for a minute. <laughs> and the sermon is then changed <laughs> appropriately. If indeed the pastor was saying, how difficult shall it be for each man to enter the kingdom of heaven, as it would be difficult for a camel to enter the eye of the little. Immediately the rich thief comes in, he confides and says, and to those who do not have even the little that they have. <laughs> Something he called the cargo cult mentality. 
The belief by backward people that without any effort on their part, all the things that they have always desired will land in their pot of gold. We want to get the things that require effort without effort. We cannot do that. We cannot get those things which are under the bed without burning. There is no abracadabra. There is no voodoo. Prayers without action is superstition. We must liberate ourselves from the chain of sorrow and work. I'm in a proud army. And it's only fitting that I should conclude my presentation with the words of a great Italian, Dr. Aldrio. That great man who be the king, the first principal head of the great Achimota College, which I'm allowed you, I'm told you've allowed to deteriorate. <laughs> James M. and Peggy Agri had this famous story. Many of you will know it. It has been rendered differently, the story of the eagle. And James M. and Peggy Agri, it is said, told the story that one day a farmer went out into the forest to look for a bird to come and bring home and mix with his chicken and his ducks and his turkeys. And lo and behold, when he went, he found the cheek of an eagle. And he brought it home. And for five years, we are told, he, he fed it on chicken, this farmer. And it learned to live like sheep. One day, Peter Agri and immediately tells us that a naturalist came to the farmer and told the farmer, amidst your birds, I can see an eagle. And the farmer laughed and said, yes, indeed, it is an eagle. It used to be an eagle, not his words, but my own. It had some eaglehood, but we have fed it on chicken feed for so long, it has long lost its eaglehood and it has acquired chicken food. <laughs> then, of course, the naturalist said, once you are an eagle, you'll always remain an eagle. And I'll try to demonstrate on three different occasions, he tried to make the eagle fly. And the eagle would fly a little and would see the chicken feeding and he'd say, the flesh cross of Egypt, I'm coming back to you. <laughs> but on the last day, a different thing happened. The naturalist came and took the bird on the palm of his hand and hoisted himself aloft a mountain and let it go and fly. And the eagle flew and Pegirabi said, you fly, we are not children of a lesser God. You fly. So today, here, yeah, I'm telling you that we Africans, we are eagles. We have been fed on chicken feed for too long. Mm. But today, I'm telling you that we are eagles. Let us acquire our wings and let us 